before you leave today to reach out to someone that maybe you haven't seen for a while or maybe you don't know. And make sure you reach that person. We're blessed today to have our choir with us and to have playing as our organist. members to annual conference this year, Kurt and I have been asked to gather offerings for the special offering called Our a Conference, Our Kids, and this will be received at annual conference on Friday. It's a two and a half million dollar campaign that was launched in 2015, and I believe it's a five-year campaign. And it's for five child welfare agencies in the conference, and they are Babyfold, Chaddock, Cunningham Children's Home, Leslie Bates Neighborhood House, and Spiro Family Services, which was formerly the United Methodist Church Children's Home in Mount Vernon. Um, I know that last week we received an offering for Golden Cross, and these were listed in that, but this is a separate thing that our conference is doing, and it's through the conference that your church receives credit for this. And if you are interested in doing this, gifts can be sent to the conference through the church. You just make out a check to the church and designate that it's for our conference, our kids. It's number 6960. And this information will be in the bulletin the next two Sundays. So this is just something for you to consider uh, for our conference, for this campaign, for the kids of the conference. Thank you. One other thing, um, if you have any questions or concerns about conference, that you'd like to discuss with us, please do so. Thank you. Well, I know a little bit something about annual conference. I've been going to them for 64 years now. <laughs> this, this annual conference will mark the beginning of my 64th year in ministry. I, I can't understand that when you're only 29. <laughs> but anyway. And to support these children's homes is very <laughs> Many of you know, uh, I'm an adopted child. I don't know who 
Would you please join responsibly in the call to worship? There is one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Come, walk in the way of the Lord with songs of gladness and joy. The Lord is here to all who call upon him, who call upon him in truth. As you are able, would you please stand for our opening hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West, page 548, or the words will be projected, verses 1, 2, and 4. The church is the one place that I know of where we come together in public to admit that we're not good enough. I've been a member of Rotary for 40 some years now, and uh, every time we meet at the Rotary Club, we announce with joy the various successes we've had. I'm a part of other groups do the same thing. But in church, we come together to admit that along the line somewhere we have slipped. And so we come together for confession. Let us pray. God, our Creator, you have made all humanity in your own likeness, and you care for all that you have made. Teach us to live together as one family. Let the example of our Savior Jesus Christ dwell in us so that we would not despise any of our fellow men and women. Forgive us when from pride or hardness of heart we have belittled any for whom Christ died or injured any in whom he lives. Transform us into a people of true love so that we may seek to transform our world into a place of true peace. Amen. Let us in silence each lift his or her own prayer to God now. We are assured by scripture and words that are true and good that those who trust in the Lord shall be lifted up. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Um, Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me as we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they, he, or this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Our gospel lesson is taken from the gospel according to St. John. This, is, this passage is taken from a scene there in the upper room, the last night of our Lord's earthly life. He had gathered with his closest disciples for what we call the Last Supper. And uh, during the supper, uh, Judas, the one who betrayed him, got up and left. And the scripture begins there. When he, that is Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God had been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But I give you a new commandment, that you love one another Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray.
Dear God, we come together from many different places. We come from a week that's been filled with good things or bad things. Some of us have been under terrible pressure. Some of us have found great joy. Some of us have plodded through each day with little change. We come here joined together, though, to hear your word. Open our minds to fresh truth. Open our hearts to your spirit. Open our hands to one another. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. One of the poems that I learned in high school English class, and maybe you did too, was Robert Frost's Mending Wall. You remember that one? I remember it, but I can't quote it, so let me read it. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair when they have left not one stone upon another. But they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. But the gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill. And on a day, we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves and some are so nearly balls that we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side, it, it comes to a little more. But there where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines. I tell him, but he only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly. And I'd rather he, he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only, but in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying. And he likes having thought of it so well, he says it again. Good fences make good neighbors. We didn't have a fence around our yard when I was growing up, although we had neighbors who fenced in their gardens to keep them from errant animals and heedless little boys. I was one of those. But we had other walls in our small town invisible walls that I didn't really think much about until 
Much later, long after I had grown up and moved away, one fence in our town was religion. There was only one Roman Catholic family in town, and they lived on my street. They were the only fa Roman Catholic family as far as I knew, and I think they were the loneliest people in the community. They were pretty much ignored. And of course, another fence was labeled race. There were people of other races in the area, of course, but we didn't live with them. We were a sundown town, and come sundown, those others had better be gone. As I grew older, other, the fences became ever so more obvious, especially in the 1950s and 1960s. The, the wall marked race became overwhelmingly real as the civil rights movement heated up. And it was as true in the churches as much as anywhere. Did you know that our denomination was officially segregated until 1968? 1968. We had a separate structure for blacks from whites. The blacks had their own annual conference right here beside us. The blacks had their own bishops, their own district superintendents. The whites had their own bishops, their own district superintendents. We were all Methodist, but we never met. It was a wall. And the racial wall in this country, as in others, has never fully come down. Think of the fussing over voting in various places here in America. And, and much of that fuss about voting is over race. And we have extended the wall in one sense, from that between white and black to include or exclude Hispanics and other like groups. Who are the people most worrying some of us coming from the south to our border? And of course, Native Americans have always known about walls. White people have been putting up walls around themselves ever since we first came on the scene. My ancestors, the Palmer ancestors, came to this country from England in 1619, a year before the Mayflower came, came to Massachusetts. My ancestors came to the Jamestown settlement among the earliest English settlers. And they started building walls pretty quickly against the Native Americans. For a long time, our denomination had another fence, one that's still up in some denominations, that of gender. In some denominations, women cannot be ministers. They, they can't even teach Sunday school class if there are men in the class. They can only teach classes of women. The Methodist Church first approved ordaining women as, as ministers, as elders, to serve a church and be pastor of a church in 1958. But very few of them were allowed in, and only in certain places, very liberal places, certainly not around here. One of the first women to be ordained remembered that when the district superintendent brought her to her first parish, a man said, a minister in skirts will never stand in our pulpit. She says he later became one of her best supporters, but it took a while. Another wall in our times has become that of religion. Jews and Muslims have been part of this country from its beginning, but still synagogues and mosques are defaced in this free land, sometimes even set on fire. And still, threats and gunfire are too often heard. Walls, fences, they're still being raised. 
Now in our United Methodist Church, we have another heated battle. For the 50 years of our existence, because we were formed as United Methodist Church in 1968, we've only been around now for 51 years. And all that time, we have argued about the status of homosexuals. We have said that homosexuals, no less than heterosexuals, are children of God and are entitled to the ministries of the church. But we've not allowed them into the ministry. And we have said that the practice of homosexuality is contrary to Christian teaching. And now our general conference, our governing body, when it met last, last year in St. Louis, has reaffirmed those exclusions and strengthened the sanctions against anyone who disagrees. But that has instilled the controversy. And it looks as if we're heading into a civil war, at least of words. And there's no end in sight. People are leaving the church. And no matter what is finally decided about this, whether to bring the wall down or to strengthen the wall, I think there will be many more gone. Good walls make good neighbors? Well, it doesn't seem so right now. And so we come to the scripture of the morning. It took me a long time to get here, didn't it? Simon Peter was a Jew. Jews know something about walls and fences. They've been walled in by other people for a long time. But even more, they have walls. Maintaining their distinctiveness is what has allowed them to survive as a people through centuries of persecution. And one of the fences which marked them as special was the prohibition against eating unclean animals, of which the Bible has a fairly large list. Most famous, of course, are pigs. A Jew still cannot eat the flesh of a, of a hog, swine. But there are others. And as a good Jew, Peter wasn't about to touch any of them. He had never eaten pork. And then he had the dream. There was a sheet let down from heaven, filled with unclean critters. And the divine voice commanded him to kill and eat. And he refused, of course. Lord, I've never done that. You told me not to. It's in our scripture. I can't do that. And when he said that, he was told, what God has cleansed, you must not call unclean. And it happened three times that night in the dream. And when he awoke, he understood what this nightmare was trying to tell him. He was being summoned to spread the word to Gentiles. Even worse, he was being called to go to the home of a Roman officer, a commander of the oppressors, who had conquered his country, who now stood, stood guard on every street corner in the city. If Gentiles were unclean, as the rabbis interpreting God's law taught, a Roman officer was even worse. And Simon Peter had every reason to shy away from, from going to a Roman officer's house. God had built that wall. The rabbis said, you shouldn't even let the shadow of a Gentile touch you. If you were eating your food at your, at your dining table at home and a, a Gentile walked by the window and his shadow fell through the window on your food, you were to get up and throw the food away. It was no good. It had been spoiled by the shadow of a Gentile. Now he was being asked to go to the home of a Gentile. How could he do that? But Simon's dream meant that God was tearing that wall down. 
And it wasn't the first time. That was the whole point of the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. You remember Jonah? He was the prophet sent much against his will to preach to the enemies of his country. He didn't want to go. He tried to escape. And so he was swallowed by a great fish. He was down in the mouth, but he, everything came out all right. It was the point of the book of Ruth, the Gentile woman who became ancestress to the greatest king Israel had ever had, King David. And of course, Jesus himself tore the wall down when he spoke to the Gentile woman by the well as if she were an equal, when he healed the child of a Canaanite woman. Canaanites were the ancient antagonist of Israel. And he made a hated Samaritan the hero of one of his most famous parables. Jesus' ministry was all about tearing walls down. Something there is that doesn't like a wall, Frost said. And Simon Peter discovered that this something is God. In this day, when our world is so intent on building walls, building more walls, in fact, in Europe, North America, so many places, when the church is struggling with its walls, perhaps we need to hear once again the message, what God has cleansed, we must not call unclean. And to learn once more the lesson Jesus taught, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you you also should love one another. For by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Amen. Let us respond to these words with our own statement of faith. We United Methodists have always been troublemakers. John Wesley and those earliest Methodists went places that church people weren't supposed to go to preach the word. They went to the mines, they went to the factories, they went where people were hurting. They went to the people who felt unwelcome in church. That's what it was to be a Methodist. And inevitably, we've said and done things that were not very popular in society. In 1908, our general conference at that time passed the very first statement of affirmation about social issues. And they said radical things. For instance, they spoke up for the right of collective bargaining, that is, the right to have a union. 1908, that was terribly radical. Only communists and, and bomb throwers would support a, a union in those days. But the Methodists said they supported it, and they were the first denomination to do it. And we see parts of that belief in this World Methodist Social Affirmation, which is part of our Book of Discipline, part of our Book of Laws. And I invite you to join with me responsively in it. We believe in God, creator of the world and all, of all people, and in Jesus Christ, incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit, 
present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough, in all responsible use of the earth's resources. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, through the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or birth, or faith through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power in personal, communal, national, and international life, through the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence, through the abuse of technology, which endangers the earth and all life upon it, We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Amen. Let us join together in singing our hymn of response, number 560, and as we do that, we may remain seated.
There are copies of the sermon, printed copies, at the back of the uh, of the church. For those who are hard of hearing, but I especially uh, like to print it up because I want people to be mad at what I said, not at what they thought I said. <laughs> and now we come to the time of offering ourselves. We offer our money to the offering plate. We put in our attendance cards in the offering plate. But they are signs. They are signs of giving ourselves. <coughs> God has given us so much. Life and love, family and friends, the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And we have a chance to give a small part back. Let us receive our morning offer.
thank you, O oh God, for all the gifts of life and love that you give to us. Now we return a small part of that which you've enabled us to make. Bless these gifts. Send them where we can't go to do your will. But take us and use us wherever we are, day by day, to touch the lives of those around us with grace and goodness. We pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, where the first five verses of it at least, number 549.
Doctors didn't know what was causing it, didn't know how to deal with it, tried a variety of things that didn't work. Finally turned to weekly infusions of chemotherapy, and then finally settled the blood. And then we discovered I had cancer. And again, started weekly infusions of chemotherapy, six weeks at a time, then a surgical procedure, then another six weeks of chemotherapy, another procedure. And through all that, this church helped make the difference. It was your faith, your support, your letters, your calls, your prayers that upheld Janet and me. And it was hard on Janet and it was on me. And you supported us. I haven't had a chance to say that publicly yet. But I discovered that faith, family, and friends makes all the difference in the world. You've heard me say it at benedictions time and again. And I'll say it again today. And you'll know what's behind it. May the love of God, the forgiveness we know so richly in Christ Jesus, And the help, the hope, the healing that we have through the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and evermore. And God's people said,